Great to have you along for the ride. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Glad to have this man back. It's uh, Gregory Wrightstone. He's an author. He's the executive director of the CO2 Coalition. He's a geologist, which is who we want to talk to today. And he's got a brand new book out called Very Convenient Warming. Greg, how are you? Good to see you again. Oh, really good. Good, good, good. Uh, uh, very busy trying to save the world from uh, itself. Yeah, and, uh, no, and, and God bless you for doing it. I'm guessing, and we just talked about this a minute ago, your phone must have gone crazy this morning as soon as this earthquake hit in New York. Yeah, it's, re- it's really interesting. So it's a 4.8 earthquake. Uh, it's very unusual to get an earthquake at all on the East Coast. And now this isn't a dangerous earthquake. It's big enough to feel, but usually doesn't create any damage. So it might knock some uh, plates off the, the shelf or whatever, right. maybe, uh, but, but nothing dangerous. Uh, in fact, it, I, I believe it was, I don't, have, I don't have it right in front of me. The, the biggest might have been 5.3 back in the 1800s. Right. Uh, so it's very unusual to have these. I don't think this is the beginning of any anything uh, of a trend of big earthquakes. Although I'm always leery of making predictions because you never, you know, it's really it's tough to make predictions about about anything, especially about the future. As uh, you know, but but I, I I make a confident prediction right here, Joe. Yeah. I'm going to predict before the sun goes down on the east coast. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, these climate grifters are going to pr- link this to climate change. <laughs> I was just going to ask you. Gonna I was just going to ask you that. It's like you're reading my mind. See, a good geologist can read my mind, I guess, because the question was going to be, when will they do that? And let's do that in, in just a second. But let's let's focus on why it would happen on the East Coast. You know, I've got friends in L.A. Happens all the time. It's like a something that that is not uncommon. I'm from the New York metro area. I grew up in South Florida where we had all the hurricanes. But I never once thought to myself, we might get an earthquake. So the, is this completely uh, out of the blue? As you said, it's been 150 years since it happened there, right? Yeah, it's, it's been about 50 years since there was an earthquake of this magnitude. So okay. If you have one small, and it's a small earthquake, mind you. I just, I'm at a convention here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I was speaking today, and uh, one of my, my co-workers is also a geologist that lives in Nevada, and she threw up her hands. She says, oh, that's, that's hard. We don't even talk about that in Nevada because uh, they get earthquakes all the time. But it's rare here. And it looks like it was centered on what's called the, the North Newark Basin, which is a Triassic Rift Basin. And so there, I've got two theories of what might have happened. And most sure. likely it's reactivation of this. Uh, again, it was a Triassic Rift Basin. Back at that time, about 200 million years ago, we had the supercontinent of Pangaea that started splitting apart. And so this is where the continent started splitting. It started moving, and it then it stopped. And it's, it's called a failed rift basin. And then it started where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is now is where it actually really started spreading. Because if you look at the map of the world, the globe, you can see how North America and South America just fit like a jigsaw puzzle into Africa. And right. that's what happened. So it started splitting apart. But, but it stopped, and there really hasn't been much tectonic activity uh, really for – hundreds of millions of years since that time, 150 million years. So uh, it could be that there's just some stress build up and that, you know, every five decades or century or whatever, it just builds up enough that it just releases a little bit. Uh, The other possibility might be that after the end of the last glacial advance, we had thousands of feet of ice on North America and actually caused the bed, the, the, mantle sub- to subside significantly and when the ice melted it, it it rebounded and so we have actually the east coast is subsiding because of this ice what's called isostatic rebound so it might might have been a combination of both those things but it, i wouldn't expect this to be uh an ongoing event uh but again uh, no longer will i say that and there'll be a big one tomorrow but right. uh, it's it'll be it, it it's it's most likely not to occur again like this for another possible decades or uh, so it's they're making a big deal about it in New York City they're going oh my god you know as a geologist <laughs> I'm I was I'm in Harrisburg Pennsylvania not too far from the quake and I didn't feel it as a wow. geologist I. I'm a little bit disappointed I didn't, I wasn't part of it because you know, jo- we like, we, you know, we want to go, we want to see a volcano erupt. Yeah, you we like wanna, that kind of stuff. No, I, yeah, I get we it. Be, we want to be in a, an earthquake as long as it's not catastrophic, you know. Right. I want to get shaken a little bit. 
It's the executive director of the CO2 Coalition, CO2Coalition.org, Gregory Wrightstone. Um, how, how, how closely do we monitor these things? You know what all these basins are. You probably have names for the tectonic plates for all I know. But um, I remember growing up and hearing that California was going to break into the, into the Pacific because of the San, San Andreas Fault. And of course, it didn't happen. But that's what the concern was. Do we have names for the what's happening beneath the Earth throughout the entire country, throughout the entire globe? Do we know where it's more likely to see a, 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 an Earth? earthquake and where it's less likely to see that how closely do we monitor this stuff oh it's 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 monitored very closely now bear in mind that these seismic monitors cannot you know we can pick up if you have if you're in passaic new jersey at a right. seismic station you can you know when there's something that a big earthquake or an earthquake that happens in indonesia because uh, these things travel we can pick all this up throughout the earth wow um, and so we've got we've got seismic monitoring really globally uh, and we have a pretty good idea and we we can map all the seismic activity uh, in real time and over the last it's it's been the last 50 years or so and and we're we're seismic and, and earthquakes have been happening is where they're also going to likely to happen um more often and it's it's, it's along these these names and most of these fault zones have names uh i don't know I, I don't know about this particular one right because if it if it hasn't if it hasn't moved or created any, any seismic activity in 50 years, they probably didn't even know it was there. Um, gotcha. But, but by the way, his um his book is called An Inconvenient Fact, or Inconvenient Facts, I should say. Inconvenient Facts. I've read it. It's amazing. It answers all the questions that your relatives have. And now the new book is called A Very Inconvenient, A Very Convenient Warming. I've got to be careful of the inconvenient and convenient. This is called A Very Convenient Warming. Greg, can they get it on Amazon right now? Is it everywhere? Yeah, you can just search for convenient warming. The subtitle is How Modest Warming and More CO2 Are Benefiting Humanity. I call it the greatest untold story of the yes. 21st century. Well, I mean, you, you've educated me along the years that you know having more CO2 is not bad. That actually feeds the greenery. That actually helps the earth. And, and uh, human beings don't really want sub-zero temperatures. We want a little bit of warmer temperature. So the fact that we're making it a bad thing, we're all going to be underwater soon, that's just you know alarmism that makes somebody a bunch of money, like the Carey family or something. So yeah. let's talk, a, pr- pretend like you're on the other side, and I want you to opine on what I said as well, but pretend you're on that side. Pretend you're the John Carey's and the Al Gore's of the world today. What argument are they going to make that my SUV caused this today? Well, um, boy. Is, is there one? I, I can't think of any. They, Greg, but, they're going to do it. You know they're going to do well, it. You I already predicted it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they've, they've, they've uh, uh, linked increasing toenail fungus to climate change. <laughs> they have. It's, 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 Come I mean, on. no matter what it is. It, they link it to climate change. So I'm not sure. This one I've been scratching my head as to why. Actually, there was I was on another interview earlier, and they said, well, uh, maybe it was driven by this solar eclipse that's coming. Oh, and I was like, on, no. Dude. Come on. No. Uh, the, the, you know, people come up with these wild theories. And I'm, not, I'm not sure how much time we have, Joe, but you would ask about uh, – uh, sea level rise and islands. I've got, I've got plenty of time. Take, take it. It's all yours. I want the expertise okay. today. Okay. You're going to love this. I don't think we've talked about this before. Is We're being told that there are all these islands in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean that will be underwater in a few decades. Right. Uh, the most at-risk island is the Maldives in the southern Indian Ocean. The highest point is 14 feet above sea level. That's the United Nations, number one on their hit list to be underwater uh, in a couple of decades. Okay. Think about this. 15,000 years ago, the Maldives were also just above sea level. In the last 15,000 years, sea level has risen 400 feet. Why are the Maldives not under 400 feet of water, you might ask? That's a great question. I'm asking that question, yes. <laughs> because of a geologic process known as accretion. It's it's it As the sea level rises, the islands actually grow. It's the near shore process of storms big storms wash the the near shore sands and gravels up on the island wow. it's a slow process but that's what that's you can google island accretion and learn about that it's not something i just made up and all of these islands have seen 400 feet of sea level rise but here they are just above sea level like they were 15,000 years ago nobody knows that 
Uh, well, nobody's, well, nobody's going to tell you that because if islands and if land mass and if and, and if where people are would exponentially grow with the rising waters, or and they might exponentially you know decrease with the lowering waters, then that blows their entire theory out of the water that we're uh, uh, we're facing an existential threat if we don't do something about climate change or global warming. So I mean, they, they can't teach us that because then we'll stop worrying about it. Exactly, and think about this: so the Maldives. We're rising, sea level's rising at seven inches per century. At this rate, if it continues, by 2050, we'll have two inches of sea level rise. So what they're telling you is that the Maldives have seen 400 feet of sea level rise, but they're not under not underwater. But that next two inches, look out, man, wow. it's gonna, they're going to be underwater. It's barely, it's barely to your ankles. And and never, not only that, there are 14. If you if you Google Maldives, and I think it was Forbes. Uh, they, there was a Forbes article that there were some 14 resort complexes being right. built along with four airports. Well, there, this is millions and millions of dollars that are being short, uh, insured by multinational insurance companies who avoid risk like the plague. They're not going to invest and insure millions of dollars if it's going to be underwater in a couple decades. They're just not going to do it. Well, I mean, when, when I hear politicians building on, on Hawaii on the shore or building on Martha's Vineyard at the same time telling me we should worry about the rising waters, I tend to look at what they do and not what they say. Yeah, these are these are climate grifters. They're, yes. It's the climate industrial complex. Uh, they're making a good living at it. And, and if you're a scientist and you've bought into this, it's really hard to walk that back. If you've if you've written papers and then you find out what's what's actually the truth is. Um, you know, it's it's really it takes a strong person to say, you know what, I was wrong. Uh, yeah, it's, and, well, well, it's, I, and, and some some are doing that. Some are waking up. The whole East Anglia stuff was buried. Nobody even knows about that anymore. And the fact that they were making up these numbers to make it look like it was happening when it wasn't really happening. It's Gregory Wrightstone, by the way. Wrightstone is uh, R. It's W R I G H T S T O N E. Wrightstone. Go get his book. It's called A Very Convenient Warming. You're going to love this book. It's going to give you all the answers that you need when your uncle Ed comes over for dinner and tries to tell you about how the climate is is ruining the the earth. Let me ask you quickly while I have you because I know that you're busy today. But we got a couple of minutes here. Why not? We keep on hearing from this administration, and I know that you're not a political guy, but we keep hearing from this administration that we have to go to 50% electri- electric vehicles in the next seven years or something stupid. Um, it, it, just by the science of it, are we better off as a humanity by having electric vehicles over internal combustion engines? Oh, well, not at all. And one of the biggest things we can look at is with internal combustion engines, you, you know I'm a big proponent of the benefits of carbon dioxide. Yes. And and we're actually, we've been in a, a CO2 famine. We don't have too much CO2. We don't have enough. And so the CO2 impoverishment uh, has been partially cured by this increase of and use of, of fossil fuels. And we should continue doing that. Uh, but electric vehicles are not the uh, economic savior that many people say they are. Uh, they're leading to increased pollution from wear and tear on tires. Uh, the cars themselves are significantly heavier, uh, so that causes more wear on the roads. Right. Uh, and then the, the the mining of the rare earths, the cobalt using child labor in the Congo, slave labor to create uh, solar panels in China. Uh, there's just so much wrong that goes into these. I, I call them blood blood earth minerals or blood right, minerals right. because of the, the horrific processes. It's 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 an economic nightmare. And, and their solution to, co- to solve a non-existent problem is to pave over tens of thousands of square miles of not just America, but globally of our right, grasslands, right. Our, our grasslands, our forests for solar, don't call them farms, solar facilities, industrial scale, cut down uh, mature forests in Virginia and North Carolina, make them into pallets and ship them to the United Kingdom for biofuels, uh, to cut down mature forests throughout uh, the country along the east, the west, the mid- Midwest, uh, to put up these industrial scale wind facilities. I was just in Wyoming a couple of weeks ago uh, outside of Cheyenne. It was just, um, it was just incredible. Just hundreds and hundreds of windmills, wind turbines, excuse me. And at night, just a sea of red blinking lights everywhere you could see. It was, it it was it was surreal, and I don't want that. Uh, we're fighting. We're working with Wyoming. We're working with Montana. Um, we're making some progress, Joe. Uh, we'll be we'll be testifying in Montana 
Good. Uh, Good. On Monday, and I'm traveling to Wyoming the following week uh, to testify out there. Executive Director of the CO2 Coalition, it is uh, Gregory Wrightstone. Go to CO2Coalition.org. Get his book called A Very Convenient Warming. Let me ask you one last question. Maybe give me 30 or 45 seconds on this, Greg, if you don't mind. But why do you think that people are so quick to believe the politicians that always misuse our money, that oftentimes lie to us, and they don't rely on scientists like you? They tend to go instead of to the science, where you can explain it and make us understand it. They go to the politics because the politicians are what, smooth? And they, they're they convincing? Why, why go to the people who don't know and ignore people who do? Well, because the people they're ignoring are people like me that they silence. And we are not. We are completely silenced. We are not. We, we cannot. Uh, you, there's no way you get someone like me, a common sense scientist, to be on any of the mainstream media because we're banned. We're just flat out banned. Uh, we've got people like Dr. John Klaus or the 2022 Nobel laureate in physics has just joined our board of directors. Nice. Uh, it's hard to call him a science denier, but they won't give him the time of day. Um, we, we just uh, we just sponsored the premiere of a new movie called uh, Climate the Movie, Climate the Movie, which is just awesome. It it, we, it needs to be seen anywhere. Just as Google Blue Climate Movie, the Climate the Movie, and it's it's really really good. Is there a link at the CO2 Coalition website or not? We don't, but if you just go to, uh, just Google that, Climate the Movie. Climate uh, the Movie. Climate the Movie, and I guarantee uh, that you will be in, in awe. Uh, some of the top scientists in the world, and it's a, just a wonderfully done documentary by Martin Durkin. Always amazing to have you on. Thanks for jumping in the chair on short notice today. It's Gregory Wrightstone, Executive Director, CO2 Coalition, CO2Coalition.org. Get the new book called A Very Convenient Warming right now. And Greg, we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much for jumping on today. Okay, thank you, Joe. All right, brother. We're back after this. Stay right here.